can't do this business part time. And people like Baba Jack, people like Matt Woozy and uh, Jamie Knight have uh, proved, Crows, proved I mean. Roving Crows have proven the point. If if you want to make it in this business, you've got to give up that day job. You've got to give up that uh, uh, that, that the thing that which takes you from nine to five every day and earns your money. You've really got to stick your neck out and really go for it. And if you can get some help on the way, like a publicist, uh, not so much a manager, but a publicist, I think is the thing which gets you noticed, pushes you up in the in the in, in the in the minds of people in the, in the public's eye. I think that's the most important thing. You can't stay in your local town and think you're going to make it big, because you're never going to make it big in your own. Well, you make it big in your local town with your local following, but you're never going to make it big in the country or internationally. So you're the new wave band, the aviators, suits, ties of Oxfam shop. Yep. And um, yep. package tours and all the rest of it. Well, so that's, that's sort of the thing. Content. And also offers from US bases at that time. Right. It, 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 but of course, we're still very nervous about sort of getting out of town, you know. But um, uh, we didn't actually do anything like that at all. But um, certainly the, the package tours came around, we played, and the opportunity came then to sort of do some recording. We already, always had done recording, the cassette recorder in the corner. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that we wanted to have a, a, a really good production. And at that particular time, I started a new job with the, with the council, and I was aware of uh, what uh, tape players could do, um, four tracks, eight tracks, and stuff like that. And Paul White then kindly offered to, uh, for a nice little sum, because he never does anything without money. Um, <laughs> naturally, because he had a lot of gear to pay for. And, he, and we went around to his house uh, and, um, um, and uh, recorded, five, I think it was five tracks. And that's I rehearsed really hard, and it was all done no overdubbing, CD of pants sort of uh, style, uh, no overdubs, just play the song and that's what we did. And did the, obviously the vocals were overdub, overdubbed afterwards and that was our four or five tracks were going to be used for our promo stuff. And that was the first thing you'd ever done in that sort of promo format? Absolutely, yeah. petrified once again, you know, of making a mistake, but we did, we got through it okay. And, you know... Have you still got a copy? Yeah, the cop. well the copies, all those sort of copies are still on, uh, on a big 12-inch tape, right. uh, which I must find a, a machine to actually sort of, a four-track machine. Have you machine. not got any other sort of... Well, we, we, we went down to Worcester Tech College. At this point, or was uh, well, it? Yeah, that was the whole point. Um, we wanted to sort of send this off to be turned into, into vinyl. And um, and so we, we, pu we pushed it, we pushed it, and of course, everybody was doing the same. And of course, vinyl in those days, well, it, it was an expensive commodity to have... Uh, um, Manufactured, and of course, that was the only way you could actually, apart from tapes, which I'll come on to in a second, but um, vinyl was the only thing you could actually give, um, have produced at that particular time. And of course, big investment, mm. and nobody, nobody was actually going to sort of sign anybody if they were just a sort of, just a pub band. You had to have that like, little bit extra where you could actually bring it along and uh, um, be, a, be a performer as such. And unfortunately, we went through all the major record labels, even the minor record labels, even the back back shed record labels that time, and it was so heartbreaking. Some did reply, very nice, you know. Others didn't reply, and uh, you know, at that time, we, we we sent out so many cassette copies of our, our music, and at that time, how it like it is now, we had so many cassettes, uh, and I had access to a, a cassette copy, and I thought, well, we can't sell it down things. We can't get a record. Let's just give them away at gigs, and that's what we did. The story was we actually I, Steve found the tapes buried in his cellar after all those years. We thought they lost them forever, you know. And they buried in his cellar, and managed to sort of and, and record them. And Andrew kindly played the, 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 the danceable solution, I think it was, which has got some very um, politically um, incorrect, as we are these days, you know, lyrics in. Not, not rude, but you know, you just don't say those sort of things. These days, if you ever listen to the song, you will know what I mean. <laughs> By that time, we were sort of getting to the end of our sort of um, creativity. But also, another thing which is coming on the scene as well was was uh, the mobile disco, and gradually, gigs started to dry up, and venues which used to sort of accept bands were now actually having their mobile disco in, and uh, which is such a shame because we were all basically casualties of the disco boom as it was in the in the. In the, in the mid 70s, and of course, then you had the guy from the, the council estate who got his couple of decks and his, his section of singles, and he went out and he got a few lights and he bought his little PA, and he was getting bookings, and you couldn't get bookings, and it was like this a new romantic stuff they called it, you know. And I couldn't get on with this, and this was really the end. And I looked at Steve and I said, 
Let's wind the band up. We, we're not going to compete against this sort of stuff. We've been through blues, we've been through southern rock, we've been through hard rock, we've been through mod stuff, you know, and border on the, on the verge of sort of soul band sort of style sort of music, you know. Uh, we couldn't do any more. We just ran out of steam. And that was the end. Mm. And nothing happened then for the next 20 odd years. Wow. Yeah. And, and then the situation's changed. I lost my job. And I was only employed for 18 months or so, so I had to have something to uh, keep me occupied. And I thought, well, I'll start learning how to play guitar. And in fact, I actually joined the Worcester School, School Rock Performance as, a, as an adult performer. And I learned to have a lot from that. And by chance, I was up at the Lamb again. Uh, went along to this one these things called open mics. I didn't know what open mic was, and I thought it was a strange job thing. You know. But performers were getting up there and singing away and doing things like that. And I stood by this, yeah, this lady, uh, a very petite lady. Uh, who was actually running this show and I turned to her and I said I can do that and it was Carol Lee Samson and she said you're a performer and I said no but I can do that and she said would you like a splot and I pulled up over and I said uh, you mean me play <laughs> <laughs> she said well you can, you can do it I said all right then and she said all right well look, you, you, how many songs you got and I said I said oh I'm six which is a total lie <laughs> <laughs> so she said, all right, well, it's, it's November now. I said, I'm pretty much booked up. Let, let's talk about this. Soon. Come, keep coming along. And, and so I kept going along. And, and then that was it. In February, I was set to do a slot. And I thought, what the hell am I going to play? But uh, uh, during that period of time, I actually learned a few songs. So I learned my six songs. Uh, I think it was February the 4th, I think it was. The day was it started off really badly because it snowed really heavily. That and what year was this? This is 2007. Right. And uh, in 2007, I went up there and I performed as a soloist in front of a, a good audience, bearing in mind that people couldn't get around Malvern a lot because it was snowing really heavily that day. Uh, and um, I performed, I think, uh, once again, a number of covers, uh, songs which I, I really quite liked, and, uh, and a couple of um, my, my own stuff material, you know, which, which was quite difficult to do after sort of being away, all that time away. Was there anybody there that remembered your old band? Or? Yeah, yeah, and they were throwing abuse at me. <laughs> no, they, they were very encouraging, actually. That was, that was the great thing about it. They, they, they actually they, they, they provided all the encouragement. I think it's the same time the whole family have actually turned up to watch me perform as well, which was very unnerving. <laughs> but it's great. I was gradually being asked to come and be a support act for various people like Da Vinci, like Highway 5, and that's how my relationship with, with Highway 5 started, being a support act for them. And... and um, on one occasion, it was, was one day when um, Baba Jack were running a festival, a blues festival, the Nottingham Arms in Tewkesbury. And I think it's because of a favour I did back with Baba Jack, got them up, a, a gig up at, the, up at the Lamb in their early days. And Becky called me up, she said, you're on the bill, as the Abbot of Unreason, which was what makes it my stage name at the time, the Abbot of Unreason. Uh, we got you a slot on, sun, uh, on Sunday, I think it was, uh, on Sunday afternoon, as a performer at this blues festival and at the time I was doing folk and I thought I'm going to get killed <laughs> you can't go play folk music at a blues festival my arms going to get ripped off you know and, and, and knowing at the time uh, I used to go to folk clubs you know, and folk if you didn't play folk club, folk music at folk clubs you, you know you get kicked out in fact I actually got kicked out of a folk club once for playing Richard Thomas' song My Way yeah, not not the song, not the song my way, but it was it was uh, down with the drum control, and I played it in my interpretation of it. They threw me out because I didn't do it. The rest of it was Richard Thompson. <laughs> Get out! <laughs> so I thought, well, if I go to a blues festival, and start playing folky stuff or you know stuff like I was doing at the time, I'm going to get killed. So, like I said, I, I, I've been supporting Highway Five on a couple of gigs, and I, in desperation, I phoned Nora up. I said, Nor, how many blues songs do you know? <laughs> And he said, I, I know four or five. And I said, I know four or five or two. That's a set, isn't it? How can I know a set? <laughs> so he said, what's this all about? So I told him. And he said, well, you better get round to my place. We better start rehearsing. And, of course, when you're playing with a, 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 an established musician like Nor, who is an exceptionally brilliant guitarist and showman and vocalist and songwriter, you know, uh, with 13 albums behind him, you know, as he has now, I mean, he, he's, no, he's no sort of slouch. And I was thinking, well, I'm just a basic sort of strummer, box basher, you know. Um, what do I know? But 
it was great to start working with somebody who was established as him, and, and uh, he, he taught me a lot of, 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 of craft on music and, 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 and guitaring and stuff like that. Being limited uh, as, as much as I could, could play, because obviously with, with hand injuries and things like that, sustained from playing rugby over a number of years, uh, you know, uh, there were limits, limits I, which I could do at the time. So we got a set together of nine numbers, marched off down to um, down to Tewkesbury. Um, Nor dug his really, really old-fashioned Roger guitar out at that time for that specific thing, his first airing this guitar I ever had. And Becky looked at both of us as we walked through and she said, I thought it was just you. And I said, no, we're a duo now. She said, oh, right, okay. Anyway, we went on, we played, and we got through, and we got paid. <laughs> and somebody came along and said, hey, we like your sound so much, this acoustic electric thing, we want to book you. And so... That started, so what we call ourselves, we, you know, we can't be called Abbott and Reason, our mates, or Highway 5 and Plus One, you know. Um, Abbott and Reason and a bad habit. Or <laughs> yeah. Well, we thought about various things, but at the time, Marzi Pan Moon was, was, was the name Marzi Pan Moon was, uh, was because obviously fairly new to the band. I was, I was working with Marzi Pan Moon at the time uh, as, a, as a sort of a, 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 as a player. And um, one of the names we were throwing around was called um, Stepping on Spiders. So I thought this is quite a good name, and Norm said no, it's rubbish. <laughs> uh, but then I found there's a band in Wales once again uh, called Stepping on Spiders. So I thought, well, oh, blues, stomping. That's it, stomping on spiders. And little did I know that there's actually an arcade game called Stomping Spiders. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realise that until many a couple of years later, and somebody sent, sent a photograph through. Performers now are coming on big time in Worcester. There's so many of them are brought on by the festival. Let's move on to the next stage now. Let's start being a bit more imaginative. What we can do as performers, as as promoters, as venue owners. Let's the venue owners got to give the promoters the chance to show what they can do. The the, the, the bands or performers then have got to show the, the promoters what they can provide. And it, it it is a it's a partnership which needs which actually has developed very very well for the Worcester Music Festival. And God, God save the Worcester Music Festival because it's, it's actually done us a, a, a great deal of of good in in the city. So what's the music festival as well, and, and Malvern Rocks has said quite openly, we're doing the what's the music festival in what Malvern, and yeah. they're joining forces. Yeah, yeah. So. And, and it's, it's great to see, and that's what I mean about sort of uh, people getting together and actually operating together. Two established um, institutions, or one more mature than the other, getting together. And, and if promoters can do that, if, if festivals can do that, then what, why can't we sort of bring together more together uh, uh, performers together at a local level? And Worcester Music Festival is so special. It is really so special. People don't realise. I, I, I was at the start of it, um, sadly because of commitments, I cannot be part of it now. And it has moved on to greater things. But there are people out there on the fringes of, of uh, performers or promoters who could give a lot more effort to Worcester Music Festival than I can. And it'd be brilliant to see a huge, great festival on Pitchcroft. But it ain't going to happen because it's too expensive. And I think we have a very unique festival, a three day festival held indoors, I mean, no matter how much it rains and the winds outside and the blowers outside, you know, we've still got performers going on there. But one thing of the festival I'd like to see is more interaction with the venue owners and the promoters with the bands. And it'd be nice to, <clears throat> for people, as well as collecting for the charity, and I know it is a, a, cha a charitable organisation, but let's pass around the hat as well for the bands. It's done up to it's done up to uh, up to a festival. Yes, you have to pay to get into some venues, uh, but the but the gigs I've been to have been free. Uh, the performers that have played there, but they pass around the hat. And over the weekend, you can collect an awful lot of money. People put the odd fifty pence in or whatever else, and that gives the performers a bit of extra cash. Maybe about twenty or thirty quid, but hey, it's it's some effort for their for their slot they've actually put on. So let's try and think about doing that for the Worcester Music Festival. Let's think about giving something back. If it's not to buy the merchandise from the performer, not everybody's got their money in their pocket at the time to do that, maybe just throw 50 pence in the bucket. 50 pence for the, for the charity, 50 pence for the performers. And that money gets divided up at the end of the day. So really, promoters, if you want to sort of really make your bands feel welcome at these sort of things, get out there and start thinking about sort of organising a collection for the bands because you've got all weekend to do it.